Many people are vegetarian because of how they treat animals, but still eat dairy since no animals are killed. How are cows that produce milk treated? Tragically, the cows that produce most of the milk in our dairy industry today are treated like four-legged milk pumps. And it's, it's pretty painful even to think about it. I live in the state of California where we have had a, a massive ad campaign from the California Dairy Council uh, talking about how uh, good milk comes from happy cows and happy cows come from California, showing pictures of cows grazing in huge fields with slogans like, so much grass, so little time. And under a uh, lawsuit investigation, it was concluded that those pictures plastered on billboards across the United States were actually taken in New Zealand. There actually isn't a whole lot of cows grazing on grass in the dairy industry in California. Most of our dairy comes from cows in the Central Valley where it's fairly dry and many of these cows never see a blade of grass in their entire lives. They live on, on uh, you know, barren ground and their babies are taken from them at a day of, within a day of birth. So the cows are left crying for their little ones. They're milked by machines in this mechanistic situation and they're, they're treated like machines. And as a human being of conscience who wants to contribute to a more compassionate and healthy world, I don't want to support that with my dollars and I don't want to take that into my body. Most of our milk is coming from cows that are pumped full of recombinant bovine growth hormone, which causes their udders to expand dramatically. Many of them cannot walk properly because their udders are literally so big they're dragging to the ground. They get udder infections, mastitis, all sorts of problems. And uh, this is because we're trying to get as much milk as possible out of them for as little possible money as possible. And uh, the cows are not treated like living sentient creatures. They're treated like commodities. I think they are living and sentient creatures, and I personally am allergic to dairy, so it's kind of a non-issue for me, but if I was going to consume dairy, I wouldn't want to consume any that came from that situation. Grass-fed, pasture-raised all the way is pretty critically important, and even then you've still got an ethical dilemma with veal, because the cows are having babies. That's how they make milk, is because they keep having babies. They are mammals, after all, and the babies are taken away from them so that we can consume their milk and then those babies are often turned into veal if they're boys or dairy cows if they're girls. And the veal industry is not something I want to support either, but it's intimately connected with the dairy industry. Isn't it natural for an animal to provide milk? What's wrong with us getting it from animals? It's totally natural for animals, mammals, to provide milk. And I think that uh, the, the mother-baby bond is precious and sacred and amazing, and milk is nature's most perfect food. Cow milk is nature's most perfect food for a baby calf that has four stomachs and will double its birth weight in 47 days. And, um, you know, that likes to eat grass when it gets older. Unfortunately, we're a little bit different constitutionally. Cow milk is quite different from human milk, nutritionally speaking. And we are the only species in the world that drinks the milk of another mammal or that drinks any milk after infancy. So, uh, yes, it's something of a norm in the modern world, but it's definitely an acquired habit. And from an evolutionary perspective, no, our, our bodies didn't design drinking the milk of cows. This is a very relatively modern construction. Now, obviously, there are a lot of things that are modern that we get used to, and that doesn't inherently make something bad. But to say that for some kind of evolutionary reason, this is how we're designed to be is kind of ridiculous. Is it true that only pregnant cows provide milk? Only recently pregnant cows provide milk. Those cows that have had babies in the last while. <laughs> Obviously, some cows are pregnant and nursing because that's how the industry pushes them. But for the most part, no, pregnant cows don't provide milk. But recently pregnant cows do. Yes, they have to have had babies recently because that's what the milk was designed for by Mother Nature. If climate change is left unchecked, rising temperatures, extreme weather, and land degradation could trigger a global food crisis, according to a report released by the United Nations panel. How does eating animal products contribute to climate change and rising temperatures? We face a crisis in the world today with our climate, and it's one that we won't see the full effects of our current actions for decades. So because of this long tail, we've got to start taking action right away if we want to leave a, a viable world for future generations. 
And it turns out that what we eat is the single most powerful place we can have an impact on this in our everyday choices. I mean, there's lots of stuff that's got to happen if we're going to reverse climate change. But food turns out to be absolutely critical. And it can be good or bad because it is actually possible to sequester carbon in the soil and then to harvest it, essentially. And it does good in the soil. We, we need to build up our topsoil. We have a topsoil erosion crisis. We have lost so much carbon out of our soils that a lot of that is ending up in net effect in our atmosphere. So we've got to reverse that. But the, the central driver of the decarbonation of our soil, decarbonization of our soils, is animal agriculture. And uh, all over the world, we're seeing forests chopped down or burned so we can create grazing land for cattle or land on which we can grow food for cattle. We are seeing huge amounts of farmland that are being used to grow food for cattle for our factory farms. And there's waste everywhere you go. You see, for humans to eat foliage is relatively efficient. But for us to eat animals who ate foliage is a lot less efficient. That's just the bottom line of it because a lot of that uh, the, um, the calories they consume are going to go into hoof and hide and bones and manure and energy they use to move around and eruptations, their farts and belching, which cows do quite a lot of with all their four stomachs. And so it turns out that this is a major driver of climate change because we've got all this methane going into the atmosphere, which is 27 times more potent as a greenhouse gas even than carbon dioxide. So what's happening is, if you, when UN researchers looked at the data, they ended up concluding that Cows impact our climate more than cars do, more than the entire transportation sector, all the cars and trucks and ships and planes and trains combined just for animal agriculture. Cattle uh, livestock production in total actually represents about 83% of all agricultural land on planet Earth for 17% of the calories that we, that we consume. So it's this very wasteful system. It takes about 12 pounds of grain or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef takes a lot of acreage to, to sustainably graze one cow. So when you look at this on a global scale, the impacts are immense. And you know, there's a lot of problems that feel overwhelming. And, and this is one place where we can really make a difference. We can vote with our knives and forks every day for a more sustainable world. Now, I want to go further than just moving away from animal products. I want our agricultural system to be regenerative so we can capture the carbon and sequester it into the soil. And this is a growing movement that I think is critically important. And so one of the ways we can do that is with organic agriculture, more sustainable methods, and then there's a whole science of it. And ultimately, we've got to be paying our farmers to not just grow food for us, but sequester carbon in our soil so we can start reversing this global climate change epidemic. How does eating animal products increase the use of genetically modified foods? Most of the genetically modified foods in our food system today are actually not eaten by humans. They're eaten by livestock in our factory farms because virtually all of the feed that is going to our livestock is genetically engineered, mostly corn and soy. And so if you want to cut down on the amount of glyphosate being sprayed on our cropland, if you want to cut down on the amount of GMOs that are being grown, the number one step you can take is to eat less factory farmed animal products. And by the way, if you think that the animal products you consume are not factory farmed, you may want to look a little bit deeper because about 99% of the meat, dairy, and eggs in the United States today are factory farmed. It doesn't matter if they have a picture of a nice chicken on the front or if they say natural on the package, they still are coming from a factory farm unless it's explicitly pasture raised and grass fed, then that's what you're dealing with. Ocean acidity has increased by 30% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This increase is 100 times faster than any change in acidity experienced by marine organisms for at least the last 20 million years. How does eating animal products contribute to ocean acidification? Ocean acidification is a, it's a devastating problem, and it's being driven by pesticide runoff from our agricultural system, uh, among other things. And just to look at that for a second, we are mostly growing food for livestock. So a lot of the pesticides that are growing on our land are also going onto crops that are being fed to livestock. Therefore, if you eat less animal products, you are contributing to less of that agricultural overload and less pesticides on our croplands, 
which are going to end up in our waters. So that's one thing. Um, then ocean acidification is also being fueled in part by the, the, the climate crisis itself, by the, the, the carbonization of our atmosphere, which in turn ends up in our waters and in our oceans. There too, by eating lower on the food chain, you take a bite out of climate change. There's a lot of steps we have to take to clean up our waters and our world so that we don't destroy our planet for future generations. Eating lower on the food chain is probably numero uno if you want to get started right away. While independent media outlets still exist, and there are a lot of them, the major outlets in the United States are almost all owned by just six conglomerates. How does this contribute to the amount of animal products that are eaten in the United States? One of the things that concerns me in the world today is that for all of the diversity of thought that we think we have with the internet, the reality is that there are a, some, a few established interests that um, are actually using the new technologies to assert more and more control over our thoughts and over the conversations that take place in our world. And this is somewhat chilling, but there's some very smart people that are paid a whole lot of money to control the conversation. And so we think we're free thinkers, and maybe we are, and hopefully we are, but a lot of times we're not as free as we really think we are. For example, the algorithms that Facebook or Google create uh, determine what we're exposed to, what shows up in our newsfeed, what conversations are happening. And so two human beings can literally Google the same thing, like climate change. And one will see I, I search uh, results collection that will focus a lot on stock prices of oil, for example. And another one will see stuff that's all about radical activism and rallies that are taking place. And these are two people that are Googling the exact same terms, but Google has learned what they're interested in and it follows, it keeps them in that rut, if you will. And so what concerns me is, yes, we think, well, we can choose between Fox and CNN and MSNBC and whatever, but the reality is that these are um, all uh, fundamentally subscribe to certain common narratives. And among those is that the modern industrialized food system is normal, and that the status quo is acceptable. And we argue all the time about who should pay for medical coverage. But we're not addressing the real issue, which is that it doesn't matter who pays for the medical coverage if we, no one can afford it. Because whether it goes through the government or it goes from private parties or it goes from companies, a million dollar operation is expensive. And at the end of the day, we're all paying for the pool of it one way or the other. And so the bottom line is, how do we cut down on this rampant, out of control medical spending, three and a half trillion dollars in the last year in the United States? How do we cut that down? So that we're not having to fight about who pays for it because it's not gonna bankrupt anybody. And that starts with prevention. And that starts with changing the food on our plates and our diet and lifestyle choices. Because the vast majority of our medical spending is on disease symptom management for chronic illness illnesses that are directly impacted by diet and lifestyle choices. So the, the modern media system is getting funding from the junk food industry through the ads that it receives. It's getting funding from the pharmaceutical industry. And all of these ad dollars are keeping the conversation within a certain narrow framework. Fortunately, you don't have to buy into it. You can open your mind and you can put what we're learning into action and change your life. Do fish grown on fish farms cause any health or environmental issues? Fish farms are growing rapidly. In fact, most of the fish eaten by humans today is coming from farms. And at one level, it makes sense because we're strip mining our oceans and there are just simply aren't that many fish left in them. In fact, if current trends continue by the year 2050, we'll have more plastic in the oceans than we'll have fish. And uh, so more and more of the fish are getting plastic in their bodies, and that's making them sick. And then they're getting you know, overfished, which is causing another set of problems. And we have the acidification of our oceans, which is also throwing them off. We have warming oceans, which is throwing off the migratory patterns of the fish. All of this is creating some serious problems for marine life. So it makes sense that humans whose appetite for fish seems to only go up would want to create farms as another way of producing fish that doesn't have all those impacts and isn't dependent on a depleting resource. Unfortunately, 
fish farms generally exacerbate the problem even more because it takes fish to feed fish. So where's that fish coming from? Often from the oceans. And in a bizarre irony, we're finding that it takes about five pounds of fish to produce one pound of fish in, for example, f salmon farming operations. So it hasn't really helped the oceans a whole lot because in many cases we're strip mining, maybe bycatch, maybe some of the less appealing fish for humans are getting fed into fish farms, but still we're depleting resources in the process. And when we sequester large amounts of fish in a small area, guess what? That water gets very polluted with their poop and disease can spread. So the industry's answer to this in many cases is to put antibiotics in the water so that the animals won't die while they're surrounded by disease. Just like in our factory farms where we're feeding the livestock antibiotics. So um, salmon, for example, is also given pink food coloring into the water so that it will be pink because it's not being fed its natural diet. And if they didn't do that, farmed salmon would be gray, which is less appealing to the consumer. So it's not a very natural situation. There are some people who are trying to do fish farming better, more sustainably, more humanely. More power to them. I mean, whether or not you choose to eat fish, I think we could all agree that a more humane and sustainable world is a step in the right direction for those who do. And at least that's my, my vantage point. But um, the bottom line is do not be deceived. The vast majority of fish farming out there is in an ecological and ethical disaster. And it's creating products that are fundamentally different from a health perspective than the wild ocean fish for consumers. Uh, you mentioned that factory farms are still a, a, play a major role in what we're eating in this country. Um, you also mentioned the treatment of cows there. Can you discuss a little bit more about the treatment of pigs and, and chicken? Is that getting any better? I wish I could tell you that treatment of pigs and chickens was getting better. And in small ways, it is. Um, Gestational crates for mother pigs have been banned in some US states and the entire European Union. These are crates where mama pigs are kept unable to walk for months at a time after giving birth and around the birth process. And they are in terribly confined quarters and they're not even able to interact with their babies except through metal slats. The babies can nurse and uh, the mothers are being treated uh, horrendously in these situations. Um, it's, fortunately, it's been banned in some states and in Europe, but it still continues for the most part. Um, when it comes to chickens, we're seeing a movement away from cages, but unfortunately, we're not giving the birds any more room. We're just sticking them in essentially larger cages. So instead of five birds in a cage, there might be 5,000 or 10,000 in a warehouse, but there's still not given enough room to spread their wings, maybe uh, about one square foot per bird, which if you think about a three foot wingspan for a bird is kind of pathetic. And <clears throat> it, the norm for, for the broiler industry today is that they are on uh, concrete, they stand in poop all day long, they're never, um, it's cleaned every few years, so they're literally on the poop of themselves and generations of birds before them. They are bred to be morbidly obese. So by the time they're three months old, it's the equivalent to if a human infant, infant weighed 600 pounds. As such, they're unable to walk. They're, they're sitting in poop all day long, and so their feathers fall off. They develop sores. 5% of the birds in one commercial operation that I spoke with the owner of uh, die before they are killed. So there are dead bodies littering around. There are open sores on countless birds, and they're sitting in poop. No wonder most of our chicken meat today is contaminated, contaminated with salmonella or E. coli or other pathogens. And guess what? A lot of those pathogens are antibiotic resistant. So we're breeding antibiotic resistant bacteria in this toxic soup. It comes back to the consumer, of course, because when you eat a product of a level of misery like that, it's not going to do your body any good, and you're exposing yourself to serious harm from the bacteria that are contaminating these birds. Um, personally, as a human being of conscience, I don't want to participate in a system like that. I don't want to support it with my dollars. I don't want to see birds treated like this. Um, 
they may not be as smart as dogs or humans, but they feel, and there's no question that they're suffering, and they're miserable. And I don't want to contribute to that, and I don't want to take it into my body. And I invite you to consider seriously, if you're somebody who does eat chicken, to consider seriously whether it's aligned with your integrity and your values, and whether you may want to consider making a different choice. By 2025, two-thirds of the world's population may face water shortages, and ecosystems around the world will suffer even more. How does eating animal products contribute to water shortages? It takes about 12 pounds of grain <clears throat> or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef in the United States today, about four pounds <clears throat> per pound of, chi of chicken, maybe four per pound of pork. It's like a protein factory in reverse. Take four pounds or 12 pounds in and get one pound out. What happens to the rest? A lot of it's turning into hoof, hide, bones, manure, energy the animal uses, etc. It's very wasteful. And when that grain or soy is watered, which it is, then we are wasting a lot of water in the process. But it gets worse than that because some cows graze in fields. They eat pasture. But in places like California where I live, it's dry in the summertime. So if you're going to have grass-fed meat in California or a lot of other places, that pasture is irrigated suddenly you're watering grass, which turns out to be extremely inefficient from a resource standpoint. And if you look at the water pollution, you get a whole other layer because livestock poop, and there's most of that poop is washed away one way or the other, and it ends up often in huge lagoons or estuaries, and it seeps into the water, and it gets into the groundwater. And so we have a massive amount of our rivers, our streams, our groundwater, even our aquifers that are now being contaminated with the seepage from these massive quantities of manure. Because guess what? Cattle don't pay for sewer hookups. So when you put all that together, livestock are responsible for an enormous amount of our water consumption and our water pollution. In fact, the numbers are rather staggering. According to the USDA, the average pound of beef in the United States today is takes about 2,000 gallons of water to produce one pound of feedlot beef, which is kind of astronomical. Think about a stack of one gallon water jugs, almost half a mile high, just for a single pound of beef. So statistically, if you look at how much water the average American uses for showering, you actually may use more water for a pound of beef than you would for three months worth of showers, just for one pound. So when you add this up over time, the, the, the data is overwhelming. And if we want to conserve water, the number one thing we can do is to eat less animal products. In my state of California, they, um, we, we have re recurrent droughts. And they tell us if it's, you know, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. And you know, we, have, we do a lot to save water. And we take short showers. And we turn off the water while we're brushing our teeth. And this is all good stuff. And humanity as a whole is facing a, a looming epidemic water crisis as we're depleting our aquifers. So it's not just California. But if you actually look at the data, in, in the state of California, livestock alone use up more water than all civilian use, all business use, and all government use combined. Just livestock. Um, we export enough water every year to China in the form of alfalfa that they're going to feed their livestock more than the entire city of San Francisco uses. Our dairy industry is using up massive amounts of water, so is our beef industry, and it's just one state. This is true all over the place. And so, again, the number one thing you can do if you want to conserve water for future generations is to eat less meat. A UN report says species extinction rates are accelerating and goes on to say nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history with grave impacts on people around the world likely. How does eating animal products contribute to species extinction? Species extinction is a terrifying reality. We are losing biodiversity. We are in the midst of what many researchers are calling the, the sixth great mass extinction. But this time it's not being caused by an asteroid or some force beyond our control. It's literally being caused by us as a species and what we're doing. We are destroying tropical rainforests. We're 
which are like the lungs of the planet, and we're, which are hotbeds of biological diversity. We're also d just destroying microorganisms that we can't even see in our soil as we poison it with pesticides, as it washes away, as, as we monocrop. We're losing biological diversity. So it's underneath us, it's all around us, it's in the air we breathe, our microbiomes are being depleted, the amount of di micro micro microbial diversity in our bodies is going down. All of this is intimately connected. And all over the world, we are seeing that the amount of resources it takes to produce livestock and livestock feed are fueling this. We're chopping down rainforests so we can get, create grazing land for cattle, so we can create land on which to grow plantations, to grow what? Corn and soy to feed what? Cattle. And yes, there are other factors too, like oil exploration and uh, desertification, which is caused by climate change, droughts and floods, but all of these are also connected because guess what? It takes a lot of oil to produce animal agriculture. It all has to be refrigerated, frozen, frozen trucked all around. There's a lot of oil directly involved in it. And um, it turns out, of course, that livestock is so, such a driver of climate change that that too is helping to fuel the destruction of the natural world. You mentioned the issues with fish farming. Uh, eating fish seems so natural. Are there any other things wrong with eating fish that we should know about? There are a lot of studies out showing us that people are healthier statistically compared to a control group when they eat more fish. Kids have higher IQs. Um, mothers who eat fish during pregnancy, their kids are more likely to have higher IQs and so forth. And so this has fueled a, a massive growth in fish consumption worldwide. Um, I think that, that statistically and comparatively, fish is going to be healthier than beef, for example, or other animal products. And a lot of times people are replacing animal products with fish and then yeah, other, with, <laughs> um, other animal products with fish, and then they have certain health benefits. But fish comes at a great cost. Number one, it's contaminated with mercury and heavy metals because our oceans are increasingly polluted. It's increasingly contaminated with plastic as well. Um, it's unsustainable. Maybe on a micro scale, it's sustainable. You know, Joe and Billy go out and go fishing for the weekend and catch a fish while they're in a creek. You know, that's one thing. But on a massive scale, when you have trawlers that are strip mining the oceans with mile long piercing nets, when you have fish farms, that are producing you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of fish at any given moment, and they're feeding you know, massive amounts of other fish from the oceans, and then there's this huge amount of excrement. We're talking about a massive colossal scale, and on that scale, fish production and fish consumption is devastating to our environment, and it's producing products that are high in contaminants, which in turn can get into our bodies. And uh, fuel d disease, not only now, but even for generations long term, fueling birth defects and other problems. So fish is a complicated matter. The fishing industry is fairly corrupt when it comes to its environmental impact. And at the same time, on a micro scale, probably it could be sustainable for some people. Um, the question is how much and on what terms and where is it coming from? If you do choose to eat fish, then go with low mercury, don't go with the, the tuna, the big fish, the shark, go for the salmon and the sardines and so forth. But you also can choose to say no to that whole thing. A lot of people are saying they want the omega-3 fatty acids. Well, guess what? You can get them more cleanly and more safely fish free. You can get an ALA from flax seeds and chia seeds in particular. You can get DHA and EPA from an algae sourced supplement. Because guess where the fish get it from? They get it from algae. So you can buy algae source supplements and get DHA and EPA that way, and then you're completely free of all the PCBs and the, the, the various heavy metals and contaminants that are in the ocean, and you're not contributing to the devastating environmental impact of the fishing industry. You mentioned there's antibiotics in our meat. Why should I care? Antibiotics are the most potent tool that has ever been developed in the medical arsenal for helping heal human beings. They've saved millions of lives. And unfortunately, they're run we're running out of time with our antibiotics. We face the specter of a post-antibiotic world in the not too distant future. Last year, 30,000 Americans and more than 800,000 people worldwide died from antibiotic resistant bacteria. These are human beings who literally died because they got sick with 
infections that only years ago would have been cured by antibiotics, but they no longer are because the antibiotics are impotent, because the bacteria have developed resistance to them. Why? Well, partly it's because we've prescribed a lot of them and we've overprescribed antibiotics. About half the prescriptions that are given to humans are not medically necessary. But 80% of the antibiotic use in the United States, more than two-thirds of it worldwide, is actually being used in factory farms. We're giving it to livestock routinely with every dose of feed, not to help them recover from pneumonia or some sickness, but to keep them alive under deplorable conditions and to make them gain weight faster because antibiotics, it turns out, make them get fat quicker, which is another side note, interesting point, because when you're eating products of animals that are obese and that were fed antibiotics to make them obese, what do you think that's doing to you? But back to the antibiotics point, um, it's, it's terrifying because in many ways you could say that our factory farms have become biological weapons factories. They're literally breeding grounds for bacteria that are killing human beings all over the world. And I think that future generations may have every right to look back if they're suffering or dying from diseases that we knew how to cure. They will have every right to look back and say, what the heck did you do? You stole my medicine so that you could eat more meat for a few cents less per pound from factory farms. So you could torture animals and keep them alive and get away with it and fatten them faster. You took away my medicine. How will we look in our grandkids in the eye if they're dying and that's what they're saying to us? So if you're somebody who cares about the preservation and the viability of antibiotics, it's a very good reason to steer clear of factory farm meat and any meat that wasn't explicitly antibiotic free. Forests around the world are under threat. The threats manifest themselves in the form of deforestation and forest degradation. The main cause of deforestation is agriculture. How does eating animal products contribute to deforestation? Forests are the lungs of the planet. It's this beautiful sim sim symbiosis where we breathe carbon dioxide and we breathe in oxygen. And they breathe out oxygen. They breathe in carbon dioxide. We have this beautiful, exquisite balance. Unfortunately, we are overrunning the earth and we're chopping down our forests or burning them and the balance is getting out of whack. And this is one of the reasons why we have climate change uh, that we, that on the level that we're facing it because we're literally destroying the carbon sinks of the earth and in fact emitting all their carbon into the atmosphere as we burn them down. And the central driving force behind deforestation, we have cities growing, of course, we have shopping malls and houses, but we also have a whole, whole heck, heck of a lot of agricultural land. And um, in the tropical rainforest right now in Brazil, tropical rainforests are being chopped down or burned for cattle ranching land. It's the biggest number one reason. Back when Rainforest Action Network, a few decades ago, was saying, whose hand's really on the chainsaw? What's really causing the destruction of the rainforest? They ended up calling for a boycott of Burger King because they wanted to get Burger King to stop using rainforest beef. Well, eventually they won Burger King sourcing from other places. But that rainforest beef is still being bought and sold. It's still part of the food supply. And it's still part of the problem in a massive way. So if you're concerned about the future of our forests, then the number one thing you can do is to eat less animal products. There are half as many African lions than there were 25 years ago. The iconic species has disappeared from 94% of its historic range. How does eating animal products contribute to the extinction of lions and tigers and rhinos and elephants and other majestic species? The effort to provide meat to an ever-growing human population is creating strain in every biological system in the world. And that includes Africa, that includes some of the endangered species of this earth who are essentially competing with livestock for land. Well, guess what? When humans are in control of what happens on that land, lions are powerful, but they are no match for us. So they have less land to work with. They have less animals to eat because the animals they depend on as we move up the food, to move through the food chain, um, are depleted as well because they have less land on which to graze. They have less land on which to exist. We are 
essentially taking all of the wild creatures of the world and giving them less and less space to work with and less and less environmental stability to work with. As we fuel climate change through our actions, we're fueling more droughts and more floods and more climate instability, which makes it harder on every ecosystem to survive. A paper published by a respected U.S. think tank, the World Watch Institute, two World Bank environmental advertisers claim that instead of 18% of global emissions being caused by meat, the true figure is 51%. How does eating animal products contribute to 51% of global greenhouse gas emissions? Well, that report, it's controversial. It hasn't been backed up by a lot of other um, subsequent reports. But they're essentially saying that the basis for the original UN report was a bit off. It wasn't 18%. They're saying 51%. And they're factoring in some other components. Um, but I think the big thing we have to look at is what is the true cost of deforestation and all the land use that goes to livestock production. And when you factor in not only um, cattle bar belching and farts, not only you know, the, the, what it takes to grow the land, to grow the grain or the soy that they're fed and to transport the meat and to, all of that. But you also factor in what the land could have been doing if it was forest. It would be sequestering carbon instead of emitting it. And when you look at the full dynamic, then it's possible that 18% isn't high enough. Ultimately, um, we have a profoundly inefficient system when we feed biomass to livestock. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, grass, it's true, can't be eaten by humans directly. Livestock can eat it and then turn it into something we can't eat. So there are certain places in the world where the only thing they can grow is grass. And for a farmer in Tibet, you know, for a family in, in certain places in Kenya, you know, where the, where the land is too arid, to grow crops of any kind, and it can only grow grass, then sure, having a cow out there that grazes over the course of you know, 10 acres, you know, or a yak or, or a goat, um, could help that family to subsist and survive in a difficult circumstance. But for those of us who live in cities, for those of us who live in homes and have a part of the modern industrialized world and are buying our food from stores, for the most part, those are coming from very large operations. And for the most part, those very large operations are directly involved in the destruction of the natural world so that we can create more food for our voracious appetites for meat and animal products. And the destru destruction of the natural world has so many impacts from a climate perspective. And so at the end of the day, if you care about the future of our climate, if you care about the future of that our children will inherit, then I think you now is the time to light a fire in you that says, I want to participate in a healthy, ethical, and sustainable future for humanity. And now is the time to step forward and say, let's not participate in modern industrialized meat production because it is a central driver of everything we're trying to change. In 1860, the average age of the onset of puberty in girls was 16.6 .6 years. In 1920, it was 14.6, in 1950, 13.1, 1980, 12 and a half, and in 2010, it had dropped to 10 and a half. Similar sets of figures have been reported for boys, albeit with a delay of around a year. How does eating animal products contribute to the earlier age of the onset of puberty? My heart just kind of breaks with the human impact of the early onset of puberty because kids are being flooded with hormones that they are not ready for. And uh, so many girls at the age of 10, 11, 12, they're just starting to figure out who they are. And so many now are facing serious issues with self-esteem, feeling like they don't belong. Many of the girls I know are suicidal because they're filled with a lot of self-hate. And I believe that the early onset of puberty is pushing them for something that they're not biologically ready for. They're not emotionally ready for. 
they're not psychologically ready for it. I guess they are biologically ready for it. And um, this has impacts on teen pregnancy rates. This has impacts on child teen suicide rates. And I believe it's being fueled in part by what we're eating, by the presence of hormone-disrupting chemicals. And perhaps most of all, by the amount of dairy we're consuming. Because modern dairy cows are pumped full of hormones every day of their lives to keep them producing milk in large quantities. So what do you think is the impact on a human being of consuming those hormones into our bodies? Well, guess what? We're mammals too. So this can fuel uh, all kinds of hormone problems. And this is statistically proven. There are studies showing this. Now, we don't have a lot of studies looking at puberty specifically and showing that, for example, vegans or people who don't eat dairy in their childhood have later onset of first menses because there aren't that many kids growing up without milk yet. But it's starting, and I predict we will have that data soon. And it stands to reason that when you look at this correlation, we've been eating a lot more dairy over the last 150 years. It's a steady progression. And we've been treating our cows with more and more hormones during that time. And so perhaps there's a connection here. Now, correlation is not causation. We don't know with certainty what's causing it. But I would say that there's a pretty strong reason to think that it could be the dairy products that we're consuming and the way we're producing them that's driving this. More than 90% of crop varieties have disappeared from farmers' fields. Why has this happened? We live in a time of unprecedented um, loss of biodiversity. That's showing up in the natural world, and it's also showing up in the farmed world as certain high yield crops become the norm as monocropping becomes the norm and we lose something profound in that process because crop rotation, biological diversity are fundamental to healthy soil and they're fundamental to a healthy ecosystem. If you were a cabbage moth and you were looking for some cabbages, do you think you'd be interested if you could smell even 30 miles away a massive field of you know, thousands of acres of cabbage? Of course you would, and you'd smell it from a really long distance. But with biodiversity, you mix things up, and it changes the whole equation. So we're losing more crops to pests now than we were 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, percentage-wise. Even with all of the pesticides we're spraying, because we are creating such inferior, less healthy crops, and because we're doing this monocropping system. So this loss of biodiversity is bringing down nutritional value because every single type of potato has a slightly different mix. Every single type of apple has a slightly different mix. When you only get one thing or a couple things, you lose out on so much of that. But also because every potato draws different things out of the soil. Every apple draws different things out of the soil. And golden delicious are going to draw certain things, right? So when you, when you have a whole ecosystem that's getting depleted of the same nutrients that that one crop needs, then other nutrients may be there, but they're not getting tapped. So then essentially this, the nutrient value of our crop is going down, 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 because the soil is getting depleted of it. So biological diversity is critically important. This is one of the good reasons to support local farms, family farms, sustainable farms, to grow a nice garden, to compost, to support composting, whether it's on the municipal level or in your own backyard because all these ways can help to regenerate the soil and add to the biological diversity of our ecosystems. What's wrong with eating animals if they're humanely raised? From a humane perspective, I think that the factory farming industry is an ethical nightmare. And I want nothing to do with it, with my dollars, with my ethics, or certainly with my nutrition. A lot of what we call humanely raised meat or dairy products is greenwashing, essentially. The industry wants us to believe it because they can make money selling it to ethically minded consumers who otherwise might become vegan or vegetarian. But that doesn't mean it's real. You know, we have a lot of incentive to want to feel good. We, we 
sometimes I was with my cousin recently who was joking about as he was eating his um, cage-free chicken eggs, he was saying, well, this is the good kind. The farmers read them bedtime stories. And while I kind of wish it was true that farmers read them bedtime stories, that's not the truth with cage-free. Just to give that as an example, caged birds get about one square foot per bird, and there may be five birds in a little pen, you know, this big. But cage-free, maybe they get the same space, but there's 10,000 birds in a giant warehouse. And then you've got free range, which is a little better. They get about one and a half square feet per bird, maybe two square feet per bird. Still not enough to stretch their wings fully. They still may live their whole lives indoors. It just means they have to have access to the outdoors, which often there might be 10,000 birds in a giant warehouse with the artificial lighting. But they have a door that's open to a little tiny paddock where they can go outside if they want to when the weather's nice. And that's ne it's never used, and it's a tiny little, tiny little space. It's 1% of the space, perhaps. Then you've got pasture-raised, which are birds that have 108 square feet per bird. And they genuinely have access to the outdoors, and they genuinely run around. And that's what people think of when they think about free, that's what they think free range is. That's what they think cage-free is, but it's not. And pasture-raised costs about twice as much per dozen eggs. So, Pasture rays then arguably would be more humane, although you've still got issues with baby male chicks being killed at birth because, of course, they don't lay eggs. You've still got issues with chickens being killed after a year or two when their production goes down and turned into chicken soup. You're still participating in all of that, but comparatively, it's a better quality of life for the bird than the other options. So everyone has to draw their own line of what they're ethically comfortable with, but the reality is that a lot of what we think of as humane really isn't so great. And the animals are still being treat, treated pretty terribly. So if you want to know the truth, visit the farm. See what's actually happening. And if they won't let you, then that's a good sign to be very aware and very alert and very concerned. There are some folks who can find sources at factory, I mean at uh, farmers markets or other resources like that for for genuine animals that genuinely lived on the land. You still have environmental concerns to weigh in and you still have health concerns to weigh in at that point because there is an overwhelming body of data showing us that consumption of processed meats, red meats, animal products in general tend to be associated with higher rates of cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's and a host of other diseases. Now, are pasture-raised or free-range or humanely-raised animals better? Probably. But there isn't a lot of data to back that up for real, so we don't know for sure. And what we do know is that eating vegetables is good for you. And eating a whole foods, predominantly plant-based diet seems to be correlated with longer life expectancy and greater health for you. And sustainability-wise, it's arguable whether pasture-raised is actually better at all, because it actually can take more land to have animals grazing than to put them in confinement animal feeding operations and pump them full of hormones and antibiotics and give them grain and soy from farmland. I know it sounds horrendous, but that actually might be more efficient from a pure acres per pound of meat perspective. So at the end of the day, if we go pasture raise, we'd have to cut down every tree on the planet to provide for current levels of human consumption, which obviously is far from sustainable. Rainforest beef is technically pasture raised too, by the way. So I think we have to look at the, the ecosystems involved and what they're capable of and how they're being treated. So I think that yes, small amounts of pasture-raised meat could be sustainable, <clears throat> but not on the scale we're going right now. A monoculture is a single crop repeatedly grown on the same land. So why are these food sources at risk in addition to the harm being done to the environment? If you look at the bread basket of the United States right, and the Great Plains states, we, they're not growing bread. They're growing corn and soy for livestock. It takes an enormous amount of land to feed the voracious appetites of humans' livestock, the, livestock, the animals we raise for meat and dairy and eggs. And most of that land is growing monocrops, epic-sized fields of corn and soy and sorghum and other cereal crops 
for us to feed the livestock. And most of those are genetically engineered. They're all being sprayed with pesticides and being pumped full of, um, the soil is being pumped full of artificial fertilizers to increase yields. And this is having a devastating environmental impact. So if you want to have less monocrops in the world, then shop from farmers markets and support local farms and micro scale businesses. And absolutely, number one, eat less meat. Seed diversity is disappearing, and three chemical companies own more than half. Our food security hinges on the struggle now underway over who controls the Earth's seeds. Why is this underway, and, and, and why is seed diversity disappearing? A few companies now control most of the seed supply of the world. Most of the seeds that are planted and most of the crops that are grown are coming from the, these few companies. And this is kind of scary because they control life. Whoever controls the seeds controls life itself. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather see life um, be held by not something other than the profit motive of a few companies. And yet, this consolidation of power is happening partly because of market forces, partly because our agricultural system has been becoming increasingly undiverse, as quite honestly, a lot of us don't like farming. And so humans have migrated away from growing their own food. And most people don't like to be farm workers. And so we try to have machines do it. And it's easier for a machine to harvest a field when that field is all one thing, because that's how machines work, because they just like to do one thing. So we've created a farming system that is fundamentally based around convenience for machines, automation, mechanization, and mass production. And that is at complete odds with diversification and biodiversity. And this is concerning because we have less resilience now in the face of droughts and floods and extreme weather events because certain crops do better in one circumstance and others do better in other circumstances. And we now have less options to work with on a mass scale. It's concerning because we need more pesticides to control for the, the specific bugs that like to eat those specific crops. Biodiversity is a great deterrent against pests. Monocropping is not. And it's a concern also because um, with the loss of biological diversity, we are depleting soil diversity, which is in turn coming back to impact our own microbiomes. The amount of bacteria in the world and the diversity of that bacteria is plummeting. And that shows up directly in our own bodies and our own digestive tracts. It turns out that we are completely dependent on trillions of microorganisms to digest our food, to produce neurotransmitters that keep our brains happy, to function and live well. And uh, it's an intimate, intertwined relationship that we're only beginning to unpack the microbiome isn't just in your gut, it's also on your skin. It's everywhere that you interact with the world around you, inside and outside your body. And if your microbiome is depleted of those critical little critters, you're less healthy, period. So we are ravaging the biodiversity of our world. And in that process, we're destroying it on the inside as well. Fortunately, we can turn that around by choosing to eat more diverse foods, by choosing to eat from local farms and farmers, we can contribute to replenishing. Why would I care about where the waste from animal agriculture goes? How does it affect me or my health or my planet? Livestock produce a lot of excrement. They pee, they poop. That's the, that's the simple reality in elementary school language. And that, that manure, that waste accumulates. They don't pay for sewer hookups. They don't have septic systems. They don't have composting toilets. It accumulates in these massive lagoons, in these massive piles. And while some of it is recycled or reused as fertilizer, most of it is not. Our farms do not have the capacity to use most of it. So then it's, uh, it ends up contaminating our water, contaminating our air, um, contaminating our, our whole planet nitrates and nitrites, and some of the contaminants that were even in the feed that the animals ate wind up in their feces, and that too is, is there. 
And so there's these massive amounts of pollution coming out of this, which is polluting our water and our land. And uh, this comes back to haunt us because there's a lot of our groundwater, a lot of our drinking water that's contaminated. So then municipalities put more chlorine in the water to deal with that, which then creates chloramines and other toxins that are making our water less safe to drink. And uh, it's, it's a real issue. It's a big issue. And again, it's another reason why eating lower on the food chain helps to avoid it and create a safer ecosystem for all of us. Three systematic reviews of over 40 publications examining the relationship between sources of funding and research outcomes found that studies with industry funding were more likely to report results that favored the company's products than studies with independent sources of funding. How does this contribute to the amount of animal products that are consumed in the United States. The meat, dairy, and egg industries are a big lobby. They got a lot of money because we spend a lot of money on their products. And they're using that money in part to keep us eating their products and to keep, the, uh, keep us thinking they're good for us. And uh, funding of research studies is one of the most effective ways to accomplish that. They've been doing it for a long time. And uh, unfortunately, there's another factor too, which is that um, a lot of the researchers themselves have a bit of bias because they are eating certain ways and they want to keep doing so. And so just thinking about it functionally, would you expect smokers to conduct and lead an impartial study on whether or not cigarette smoking is healthy? Would you want some non-smokers in the mix? Probably, if you want accurate data. And so in the same way that people are biased by research funding and industry ties, they may also be biased by their own personal lifestyle habits and choices. So what would happen if, for example, a study on meat consumption and its health impacts uh, was conducted by 50% vegetarians? Is it possible that you would get different data? I say you might. In fact, I say I predict you would because there's research bias. And you can always lie with statistics. You can always spin it different ways. And some people do this intentionally and consciously. Some people do it a little more softly, but they're not looking to poke holes in their argument through certain lenses because of basic bias. And I'm not saying that a lot of folks are out there trying to lie to the public with studies. But I'm saying that there is a soft and subtle and pernicious way that this stuff seeps in. And if you're a researcher and your salary and your ability to feed your family depends on getting funding from various folks, then don't think you're not affected by the desire to keep that funding pool in place. And if you're the Egg Board or the National Cattlemen's Beef Association or some other industry lobby and you want to fund a study that's going to validate the value of your products, then that's, that's in your business interests. You're not impartial. Of course you want to find the researchers and the methodologies that will contribute to your product looking as good as possible, right? They're not, in, they're not impartial on this in the slightest. Why are they funding it? It's part of their business expenditures. Not because they're Puritans searching for the truth, because they want to make money selling their products. So it's a rather corrupt system. And a lot of our research um, even with the peer-reviewed research that is so important today, much of it is biased now by industry profit motive. The first global assessment of pollinators ever has found that extinction pressures on species that facilitate crop production are threatening the world's food supply with hundreds of billions of dollars worth of food and agricultural production annually at stake. What is contributing to the extinction of pollinators? We face a crisis today with bees and monarch butterflies being depleted. And there's a lot of argument about what's causing this. Some people think that it's neonicotinoids, which are a class of pesticides that is used in agriculture widely. It's been banned in the European Union. It may be banned in the United States soon, I hope. It certainly there's less of it being used now because many people are concerned. We don't know with certainty that this is the cause, but there's a lot of concern. And neonicotinoids are used extensively in genetically engineered agriculture as well. 
Um, it also may be other classes of pesticides. It could be climate change. We know that bees and monarch butterflies are sensitive, small creatures, and they're vulnerable. Clearly, they're vulnerable. And it is imperative that we figure out why, because if we destroy pollination, we will devastate our agricultural productivity in a very short period of time. And we're already on the verge of suffering massive losses because we can't lose many more bees or many more butterflies before literally crops go unfertilized, unpollinated. So we've got to do something about this. So research is important. And again, uh, livestock production is so wasteful that it causes us to push the land harder to use more pesticides to try to feed a growing population. Well, guess what? If we ate less animal products, we could free up so much grain and soy and space and land that we could afford to focus more on sustainability for future generations than on maximal yield right here and now. And in the long run, we could bring back our pollinators. We could help save our ecosystems. We could help regenerate our soil. We could help sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. We could enhance biological diversity. We'd have the resources to do that if we ate less meat. Wild animals are being poached on a massive scale with millions of individual animals of thousands of species worldwide killed or captured from their native habitats. Poaching poses a growing threat to elephants, rhinos, and other charismatic animals as well as to smaller and more obscure creatures like certain lizards and monkeys. Why should we care about the poaching of wild animals and why are they being poached? Wild animals give us something of our place in the world, I think. They awaken our sense of humanity, and so many kids feel this. They are inspired and dazzled by the elephants and the lions and all of the different wild creatures of the earth. And for good reason, these creatures carry profound spiritual, cultural significance to populations around the world. And they have profound dignity and they have a right to live. They're beautiful. And as humans, I believe we have a responsibility to be worthy stewards of this earth. We have come into a place where we are managing ecosystems and resources. So let's do it wisely and intelligently and thoughtfully and with care and respect for all the creatures of the earth. Poaching takes place when desperately poor people are trying to feed their families, they're trying to survive, and it's not like they want to go out. I mean, sure, some people may have fun killing lions or rhinos or stealing the tusks off of elephants, but the truth is, is that they're doing it often even at legal risk to themselves because they're trying to feed their families and there's a lot of money to be made from it. There's money to be made from it because some people think wrongly that these tusks or these horns or these body parts or these animals will confer some kind of magical healing power for them. And tragically, it's a, it's a lie, and it's being perpetrated in certain parts of the world at great cost to ecosystems, to animals, uh, and to our world. So um, the other piece is that these animals are already in great distress They're, because their ecosystems are so small, because we have taken over so much of the land for human uses. So when we become more sustainable, when we lower on the food chain, we free up more land to go back to wild habitat, and then we're not in such competition for scarce resources. And the animals have more room to roam, to graze, to forage, to live as nature intended. Um, but poaching is a serious concern, and, and sometimes it's also for game meat. So if you're ever traveling and you're in a place where they're serving game meat of different kinds, uh, ask some questions before you eat it, because you, otherwise you might be fueling the destruction of an endangered species. While land degradation has occurred throughout history, the pace has accelerated, reaching 30 to 35 times the historical rate, according to the United Nations. More than 75% of Earth's land area is already degraded, according to the European Commission's World Atlas of Desertification, and more than 90% could become degraded by 2050. How does eating animal products contribute to desertification? Desertification is a, is a massive concern in the world right now. And it's happening because we're chopping down forests to create grazing land for cattle or cropland. 
It's happening because we're depleting our aquifers as we're uh, using up eons of stored water underground and uh, pulling it above ground again to create cropland that we can irrigate and much of that is going to livestock. And it's also happening because of climate change, which is causing droughts in certain places as well as floods in others, destabilizing the natural water systems. And there too, when it creates droughts, then it creates deserts. And deserts become their own ecosystem. The Sahara Desert is continuously expanding because it's created its own, we can't really call it a microclimate anymore. It's a, it's a megaclimate. It's, it's several times the size of the United States now. And it continues to expand and expand and expand. I think it's about 6% of the Earth's land mass right now is the Sahara Desert. And so deserts are growing around the world, creating their own sort of perpetual growth machines, if you will, by creating an ecosystem of arid, dry land and dry weather patterns. And then it spreads. And climate change is only going to make this faster and more intense. So how does animal product consumption touch into this? Well, when we're chopping down forests, create grazing land for cattle or cropland, when we are consuming meat that is fueling climate change, then we are driving it directly. So if you eat less animal products, you're contributing to less desertification on planet Earth, which is a good thing. Soil that is able to generate viable crops is rapidly on the decline, according to senior UN official Helena Semedo. Half of the topsoil on the planet has been lost in the last 150 years, and it can take decades, if not centuries, to regenerate. Numbers suggest only 60 years of viable topsoil left at the current rate of degradation and increased usage. Half of the topsoil on the planet has been lost in the last 150 years alone. How does eating animal products contribute to the loss of topsoil? Topsoil erosion is probably the biggest problem on the earth that nobody is really talking about. Farmers today have 60 harvests left, some more, some less, but that's the average. If you go from six feet of topsoil to one foot of topsoil, you can still grow food. If you go from one foot to zero, you cannot. And it's all going down. We are eroding our topsoil rapidly. So how does meat consumption and animal product consumption contribute to this? Well, most of our livestock are eating grain and soy, and that's coming from land that is uh, being farmed unsustainably. In order to produce 12 pounds of grain or soy for one pound of feedlot beef, we've got to waste a lot, right? And a lot of that waste is fueling strain on the land to produce enough calories so that we can waste it in our livestock system. That strain on the land means that we're unsustainable. It means that we're pummeling it with pesticides and fertilizers and fungicides and poisons that are killing the land, that are making it more susceptible to rainwater runoff, that are, that are depleting it. Instead of replenishing with compost and even human waste, and um, we, we, are, we are pummeling it with fertilizers that increase the yield short term, but they destroy the soil. We want healthy soil with worms and bugs and all kinds of little critters and bacteria teeming with life. That creates an organism that is resilient so that when it rains, the soil holds the water instead of running away with the water. But what we've got is a fundamentally dead soil system, which then erodes rapidly. And most of the agricultural productivity that we're wasting through livestock um, could be saved if we ate lower on the food chain. That in turn could make it so much easier for farmers to go lighter on their fields and to focus on sustainability for future generations. And we have abundant crops left over, lots and lots of food for humanity. When sea levels rise as rapidly as they have been, even a small increase can have devastating effects on coastal habitats farther inland. It can cause destructive erosion, wetland flooding, aquifer and agricultural soil contamination with salt and lost habitat for fish, birds, and plants. How does eating animal products contribute to the rise of sea levels? Eating animal products 
is a central driver of climate change. And climate change is causing our polar ice caps to melt, which in turn is causing our oceans to rise, which in turn is causing all of the related problems from saltwater intrusion to cities being flooded, islands, entire nations being flooded. Um, what is it, 20, 30% of humanity lives on coastal areas that are at risk. We could have billions of environmental refugees this century. And climate change is fueling this. And meat is fueling climate change. Does eating animal products expose me to more pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, and other chemicals? Many toxins concentrate off the food chain. So what you carry in your body isn't just a product of what you've breathed, but also what you've eaten over the course of your life. And so then when you die, you'll have accumulated all of that over decades, hopefully, many decades of life. The same is true for animals. So fish that swim in the oceans are eating smaller fish, who in turn eat smaller fish, who in turn eat smaller fish. And certain toxins that are in the ocean can bioaccumulate up the food chain so that a big fish could have hundreds or thousands of times higher concentration of certain toxins than the water that they're swimming in. And that's also true for livestock anytime you move up the food chain. And so when a cow or a pig or a chicken or a, or a sheep has eaten throughout its life large amounts of grain or soy or other crops that were sprayed with toxic pesticides, for example, those can bioaccumulate. Certain, con um, con certain heavy metals can concentrate in the fat of the animal and in the, in the tissues of the animal. And when you eat it, you're getting all of that. You're getting a concentrated dose. So when you eat lower on the food chain, you are exposing yourself to less of those toxins. You're also steering clear of not just hormones and antibiotics, but also pathogenic bacteria that accumulate in today's modern, incredibly unsanitary, toxic factory farms. The world's insects are hurtling down the path to extinction, threatening a catastrophic collapse of nature's ecosystems, according to the first Global Scientific Review. More than 40% of insect species are declining, and a third are endangered, the an analysis found. What's causing the extinction, extinction of insects? We don't know with certainty what's causing the extinction of insects, but there's some pretty good evidence that pesticides are playing a major part. After all, we've developed these poisons to kill bugs. So it stands to reason that they aren't just killing the certain bugs that attack our crops, but they're killing other bugs too, through the air, through the water, through the soil. And these bugs, uh, not only one generation, but they may even impact their ability to reproduce they may impact their offspring's ability to reproduce. We don't know with certain which pesticides in what combination, partly because we've got a toxic soup. We're polluting our environment in devastating ways that spreads these poisons all over the world. And so, of course, insects are impacted. And they're so small that they are uniquely susceptible. And they have very short life cycles. So they can show what might, you know, we may take, uh, you know, a hundred years to go through a few generations of humans, but they only take, you know, days <laughs> to go through a few generations. So things show up faster, potentially, with a lot of the bugs. And we're seeing insects dying off at a terrifying rate, which has impacts on pollination and impacts up through the entire food chain, because it, insects are actually fundamental to a large amount of ecosystems. And the ripples spread, spread, spread from there. Now, I don't know anybody who is a big fan of bugs, but it turns out we depend on them for our lives. So we've got to do something about it. Number one thing you can do is to eat less um, pesticide-contaminated foods, go organic, and particularly eat less meat because most of the pesticides are being used on crops that are fed to livestock because most of our crops are being fed to livestock. So when you eat lower on the food chain and choose organically grown foods, you're helping say no to all of that and helping preserve the biodiversity and the bug diversity for future generations. Can you sum up everything we've talked about here today in 15 seconds? Every dollar you spend and every bite you take is a vote. You're voting for the health you want and you are voting for the world you want. By eating lower on the food chain, 
by eating more organic, whole, real plant foods, you are standing up for the healthier life for yourself. You're standing up for a healthier future for our children. You're standing up for a more ethical world for all of life. So make your stand and make your vote a conscious one. What's the one thing I must do today? If you do nothing else, I want to invite you right here and right now to look at the food on your plate and the food in your life and consider how can you bring your food choices into alignment with your values, with what you want for your life and what you want, what you want for your world. When you do that, your life will have a moral fiber, you will have an integrity, you will have a potency, you will have a sense of purpose that will carry into every domain of your life. And your body will be healthier, your mind will be clearer, and your world will be more sustainable. Why did you feel it was important for you to come speak here at the Real Truth About Health conference? I felt it was important for me to come speak at this conference because this conference creates an opportunity to reach a lot of people. And the world needs this message urgently right now. I also see this conference as a place where a lot of really smart, dedicated people are coming together because they want to spread the truth. It's all completely free. None of us are paid to be here. We're here because we have a message and a mission and we want to share it with the world. And I know that there are a lot of people in the world who are ready. Perhaps you're one of them. Thanks for being here. If people want to learn more about your work, where should they go? If you want to learn more about the work that I'm up to, join us at foodrevolution.org. Again, that's foodrevolution.org. You can sign up for our email list, join our more than half a million members who are standing up for healthy, ethical, and sustainable food. Check out our blog. We have thousands of articles, free educational resources to help empower you to make your food choices into an expression of what you want for your life and your planet. You can also check out my book, 31 Day Food Revolution. Heal your body, feel great, and transform your world. I wrote it to help you put all of this into delicious action in your life.